every choice made has led to this. My friends, my friends, we have now finally entered into the final arc of the Clone Wars series, the Siege of Mandalore. And this arc ties directly to the events of Revenge of the Sith. This is where the fun begins. And because it's directly connected to the third episode in the Star Wars saga, it answers many lingering questions, both in regards to the original film itself and the way the saga connects to the Clone Wars series. And so today I want to talk to you about how this episode relates to the original saga with five lingering questions that this episode finally answered along with three new plot holes that it introduces. Ironic. The first plot hole that this fills up is the question of why Obi-Wan and Anakin were late to the Battle of Coruscant. In the opening of Revenge of the Sith, the Battle of Coruscant is already well underway, with the fleets from both sides already in position and hovering over the planet in a full-on galactic star battle. However, Anakin and Obi-Wan show up to the battle relatively late in the grand scheme of things, only entering the conflict after both sides have already engaged and taken formation. Thanks to the events of this episode, we know that this is actually because Anakin and Obi-Wan were several systems away due to the Outer Rim sieges. I don't think they would have ever brought us back from the Outer Rim sieges. We know from Star Wars Rebels that Ahsoka last saw Anakin as he was rushing off to save the Chancellor. The last time I saw him, he was rushing off to save the Chancellor. Then everything changed. And we now get to see that event actually take place. And we can see that directly preceding the Battle of Coruscant, Anakin and Obi-Wan were actually negotiating with Bo-Katan about sending a clone reinforcement squad to Mandalore in order to help them retake it from the former Sith Maul. This little collection of details further contextualizes the opening scene from Revenge of the Sith. Oh, I see it. Oh, this is going to be easy. There's a rebel spy in our midst. Codename Fulcrum. And perhaps today we're going to learn their true identity. However, this also brings us to our first continuity issue, which comes from the name that Obi-Wan and Anakin are told is on the holocom. My name is Ahsoka Tano. When Admiral Yularen calls for Obi-Wan and Anakin to return to the ship, he says that they have a message from someone using the code name Fulcrum. When Anakin and Obi-Wan first hear this name, they assume that it is actually coming from Saw Gerrera, the freedom fighter from Onderon that they helped train in Season 5, who during the era of the Empire would come to be known as an anti-imperial terrorist by the Rebel Alliance. However, it becomes immediately clear that this is not Saw Gerrera, but another person who is using the code phrase Fulcrum. The use of the Fulcrum code phrase during the era of the Galactic Republic is actually somewhat problematic, both in terms of just the logic of Star Wars Rebels and what we know from the Ahsoka novel. Considering what we know about Fulcrum in Star Wars Rebels, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for Ahsoka to continue using a code phrase that people of the Republic, the Republic that became the Empire, would be familiar with, especially because she is trying to avoid Imperial attention. Furthermore, the end of the Ahsoka novel pretty clearly describes how Ahsoka came to pick the name Fulcrum, and there is no mention of her having used this during the era of the Republic, but it actually seems to be more something that would avoid Imperial attention rather than attract it. This contradicts the Ahsoka novel, and also poses a bit of a problem for how Ahsoka was able to continue using the codename Fulcrum, without Darth Vader, who was Anakin Skywalker, remembering the code phrase and remembering that Ahsoka used it, and using these intercepted transmissions to hunt down Ahsoka. It was foretold that you would be here. Our long-awaited meeting has come at last. I would worry about the collective wisdom of the Council if they didn't select you for this assignment. Not the best choice, by far. The next lingering question that this episode answers is why Palpatine told Anakin that he was the best choice by far to hunt down General Grievous. Now when I first saw Revenge of the Sith, I thought that this was Palpatine just flattering Anakin and stroking his ego a little bit, trying to convince him that Palpatine was the only one who truly appreciated 
Anakin's value in combat and power in the Force. However, this episode really demonstrates just how proficient Anakin is in combat and how far he outmatches all the other Jedi around him. When the episode opens, Obi-Wan Kenobi is pinned down and the 212th are having a real hard time pressing the advantage. However, Anakin quickly turns the tide with a well-calculated strike using his 501st to overwhelm the Separatist forces after he roots out and destroys the tactical droid. Not only does this also give us a little glimpse at the arrogance Anakin is coming to own up to in the end of the Clone Wars, but it really does demonstrate that he's earned this title of the best choice by far to hunt down General Grievous. Kanan said he was the greatest warrior the Jedi had in the Clone Wars. He was powerful, rarely lost a battle, but what a surprise people was how kind he was. I will do whatever you ask. Just help me save Padme's life. I can't live without her. The next little detail that this episode gives us is some of the added motivation for why Anakin is so dedicated to preventing the death of Padme. In the opening of the episode, Bo-Katan invokes Obi-Wan Kenobi's feelings for her sister Satine, asking him to take action on her behalf. Anakin is reminded here that even Obi-Wan Kenobi was able to have feelings for another, but all that was taken from him when he lost her, unable to protect her from Maul. You can see on Anakin's face his disappointment that his master had lost the person he loved, all because he was unable to protect her. This further motivates Anakin's resolve in Revenge of the Sith that he won't make the same mistake Obi-Wan did and lose his loved one because he was unable to prevent the death that he knew was coming. Remember, my dear Obi-Wan, I've loved you always. I always will. Actually, my name is Rex, Captain. 501st Clone Battalion. The next plot hole is pretty minor in the grand scheme of things, but in this episode it was really surprising for a lot of us to see that Captain Rex was promoted to the rank of Commander at the very early part of the episode so that he could lead a subdivision of the 501st to aid Ahsoka in retaking Mandalore. However, this causes a couple of small problems for future material, including but not limited to the Ahsoka novel and Star Wars Rebels, in both of which Rex is referred to by the rank of Captain. Rex, Captain. Anakin, Chancellor Palpatine is evil! From my point of view, the Jedi are evil! The next interesting thing that is contextualized from Revenge of the Sith is Anakin's line, from my point of view, the Jedi are evil. This was a line that didn't make sense to a lot of us on our first viewing of this in the theaters, as it would seem pretty obvious that the Jedi are good and the Sith are evil. And while this may seem self-explanatory, there's a lot more nuance going on in the galactic scheme of things that demonstrates to us that things might not be so clear-cut as they seem. However, Anakin's conversations in this episode, both with Obi-Wan and with Ahsoka, give us a little bit of a foreshadowing of why someone might start to believe that the Jedi could be seen as evil from a certain point of view. Ahsoka rightly points out that the Jedi are once again playing politics, ignoring those who are in need to instead go and save the Chancellor choosing a political move instead of a humanitarian one. As we saw in the last Clone Wars arc with Ahsoka and the two sisters from Coruscant's Undercity, not all actions of the Jedi are above reproach, and there are many throughout the galaxy who see the Jedi as adding to the problem rather than working to solve it. On top of this, witnessing the Jedi refuse to send resources to help his former Padawan, who was doing what she believed was right, seemed in this case to push Anakin away from faith in the Jedi. It can even be argued that Ahsoka's own journey of disillusionment really impacted how Anakin could see that the Jedi were evil. Given that the Jedi refused to defend Ahsoka when she was wrongly accused of bombing the Jedi Temple, and excommunicated her from the Order so that she could be subject to a military trial. These are not morally upright acts, and Anakin saying that from his point of view the Jedi are evil actually starts to make a lot of sense when you see the type of things that they're going through during the era of the Clone Wars, and especially surrounding his beloved Padawan, Ahsoka. Why would anyone walk away from being a Jedi?
The next question answered by this episode is one that many people have asked over the years, and it became increasingly popular after finding out that Captain Rex did not participate in Order 66. And that question is, where was he when the 501st, his men and brothers, marched on the Jedi Temple? Of course, in this episode, we find out that the 501st was actually split into two divisions. And while the 1st Division accompanied Anakin and Obi-Wan and the 212th in the Battle of Coruscant, the 2nd Division was assigned to Ahsoka, led by the newly promoted Commander Rex. This not only tells us where Captain Rex was during Order 66, as I'm sure we will get to see play out in future episodes, but also the presence of other beloved members of the 501st, such as Jesse. I'm sure we're going to get much more information about this in the future episodes, as I do believe we will get to see Order 66 from Ahsoka and Rex's perspective. I didn't betray my Jedi. We all have a choice. The good is new. Maybe a little better. The last continuity error comes in the form of Ahsoka Tano's lightsabers. Anakin tells her that he kept his lightsabers for her, good as new. When she activates them and finds that the blades that were once green are now blue, he says, okay, maybe a little better. This raises two questions. First, why in the Ahsoka novel, after Order 66, when she activates her lightsabers one last time, are they described as green and not blue? And the second is, how did they turn blue? Did Anakin meditate with the crystals in her lightsabers? Was he using them as spares or dual wielding for a time? None of these questions are really addressed or answered, and it's just kind of accepted that Ahsoka's lightsabers are blue now. But anyway, those were five lingering questions that this episode of The Clone Wars helped us answer, along with three new plot holes that it blew wide open. But let me know what you guys think. Was this a worthy trade-off for what we got versus what we lost? Ultimately, I think that most of the plot holes are pretty minor. The Fulcrum one is really the one that bothers me, but I want to know what you, my friends, have to say about this and our favorite galaxy far, far away. By the way, I wanted to give a shout out to an article that inspired this video, which was called Four Pesky Plot Holes from Revenge of the Sith that this episode of The Clone Wars solved. But when I went to go look for the article to credit here in the video, I couldn't find it. So I don't know if it was taken down, but uh, I do want to give credit where credit is due. But anyway, guys, thank you all so much for watching. Have a great day. And as always, may the lore be with you now and forever.